Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark. And in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. There's a new Batman coming. I don't know if you guys know this. I hate to be the one to tell you. Sorry if you didn't want to hear it. But supposedly, the reign of the Bat Flick is over. Bat Fleck? Flock? Affleck? You know who I mean. Look, it the, the fact is, if you believe anything you're hearing, yeah, we're probably getting a new Batman. We're already getting a new Superman. You know, look, when things don't work, just do another one. I think that's someone in D.C. had that mantra. Hey, don't worry if this screws up. We'll just do it again. Don't worry about it. We'll we'll, we'll run it back. It's fine. It's it's not. We got money. We got a lot of money. We're going to be fine. So, yeah, there's going to be another Batman. That The Twilight dude, the shiny vampire dude. Yeah, we're getting a second one of those. But let me tell you something, man. Uh, by the way, I have no beef with Robert Pattinson. I'm just trying to be cute. But uh, we're, we're getting another movie there. But is he going to be the Batman in the new continuity in James Gunn's universe? Uh, from what I'm hearing, probably not. Of course, he could change that if he wants. I don't know. But don't be surprised, kids, if and when we get another Batman. We've had several. At this point, it's like James Bond, dude. Just just recast him. Just recast him. Do it again. And again, and again, it seems, over and over and over again. Well, today we're talking about one that we've mentioned. We're, talk, we're talking about one that we've talked about in other shows. We've talked about off mic. But for some reason, for whatever reason, we just haven't gone around to doing this movie. Well, we've done it now, or we're doing it now, and I'm looking forward to this because today we're covering Batman Begins. There are some folks out there who still claim Christian Bale to be their Batman. It's their guy. If you ask me, Kevin Conroy's my Batman. Rest in peace, Kevin Conroy. And I would follow that up with Michael Keaton and then Christian Bale. But that's my own personal choice. You guys can choose whoever you want. It's all subjective anyway. But we got lots to talk about here today. The Christopher Nolan, the Nolan verse, the Bat verse, the Christopher Nolan Bat universe, whatever we're calling this. And uh, this won't be the last time we talk about this because the plan here is to do all three films. Yes, even the third one. I know what you're thinking. Tom, we don't need that. I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. But sometimes, and not every time, we are completionists here on the show. So maybe, just maybe, you'll see part three, or hear part three. But first, we're going to hit part one. And it starts like this. Batman Begins is a 2005, yes, you heard that right, Superhero film directed by the aforementioned Christopher Nolan and written by Nolan and David S. Goyer. Based on the DC Comics character Batman, it stars Christian Bale as Bruce Wayne Batman with an assorted cast of actors and characters and all of the above. And I can't wait to talk about this. And of course, as we know, this film reboots the Batman film series about telling the origin story of Bruce Wayne the death of his parents to his journey to become Batman and his fight to stop Ra's al Ghul and the Scarecrow from plunging Gotham City into chaos. Of course, this is a Warner Brothers joint. What else would it be? Released on May 31st, 2005 in Tokyo, June 15th, the United States, I suppose limited release or maybe full release, and then June 17th, 2005 in the United Kingdom. Total runtime is 140 minutes. The budget for this one, kids, is $150 million. The box office is $373.7 million. And that is your lowdown for Batman Begins. So, Phil, for whatever reason, we have not tackled this movie yet. I saw a clip somewhere on socials for this yesterday, just on a random post, and it got me thinking, hey, we should do this movie. What do you think about this movie overall? What were you telling me before we went on air today about when is when it was released? I mean, first of all, I thought when you told us uh, about the Patterson verse with uh, the Matt Reeves Batman film, 
uh, you were going to break into the Nirvana record that they played multiple times in that movie. <laughs> it was a big part of that movie for some yes. reason. Uh, something in a way is played multiple times in that movie. I mean, they paid for it, Phil. Might as well get your money's worth. Yeah, so every time I think of that movie, I think about a very rainy Gotham City, Batman, and Nirvana for some reason. And a lot of fire. There's always fire in those in that trailer for whatever reason. Yeah, very thematic. Uh, I remember, uh, of course, the Batman movies in a lot of ways were a big part of my life growing up. I would say that... Uh, Batman, in a lot of ways, was one of the first comic book characters that really brought me into the genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make an argument that Ninja Turtles came before that, but I wasn't a fan of Ninja Turtles before because of the cop because of the comic. I was, of course, a fan because of the '90s cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even know it was a comic for years. Uh, but Batman was different. Uh, when the '89 movie came out, uh, I was completely enamored. Uh, we got the animated series shortly after that. Um, I have tons of toys and Batman stuff growing up. Uh, I thought the initial Burton movies were the coolest thing ever. Uh, Batman Forever, uh, not so much. It was fine, but not so much for me. Uh, the complete and utter mess that is Batman and Robin uh, is fine as just a thing to laugh at. It's a guilty pleasure. But by all accounts, it is an atrocious movie. Uh, <laughs> Pretty awful. Yes. Pretty awful movie. But if you just want to watch it for a good laugh, to laugh at Arnold Schwarzenegger's performance and many of the other things in it, Alicia Silverstone, for whatever reason, as Batgirl, also bad. Uh, but all of those things served their purpose at time periods in my life. And this movie was no different. Uh, 2005, I remember exactly where I was. How do I get into this with not, without it being very depressing? <laughs> um, 2005, uh, my mom passed away. In June 2005. I believe she passed away on June 10th. Mm. Uh, like you said, this movie came out June 15th. Uh, my dad came and got me uh, shortly after she passed away, after the funeral and everything. And uh, he just wanted to, you know, just be with me as often, and just so I wasn't alone. And uh, one of the first things we went to do together is we went to the movie to see this. This was uh, that summer, 2005. And so I always remember it came out 2005. It came out that June. Uh, I came into this movie very cold. I don't remember many of the trailers for it. I didn't remember even being that excited for it. Uh, but my dad knew I was a Batman fan. And so he took me to go see it uh, with his uh, wife at the time. And I remember just really loving this movie. Uh, because it, it just made me forget about a lot of stuff that was actually going on in my real life. And I was actually really immersed in the movie. And uh, I was surprised with just how different it was from any other depiction we got of Batman. And that immediately made me love it. Because um, everything I loved about the Burton movies is that it had all of his style and all of his pastiche. Uh, it was a little redundant, but regardless, it had his pastiche. It had like his his set design. It felt very comic accurate in some ways. And this was the exact opposite. It was grounded. It was practical, and it it made me like it even more. You know, it, it goes back to the the idea of none of us can be Superman, but depending on your situation, if you had the proper motivation. If you had the proper finances, if you had the proper training, the proper commitment and time, you could become Batman or a variation of Batman. And this movie makes you feel like that's 100 percent true. Yeah. So there's a lot of things I immediately connected with with this movie. Um, I was uh, going to college at the time. Um, and I stayed here in Chicago when I went to college. I went to school downtown and. <laughs> that's one of the things that kind of takes me out of the movie when I see it. Is I'm like, okay, this is Chicago. Right. This is not Gotham City. This is Chicago. I for, what show did we do where we were talking about uh, the elevated train? I'm not sure what you guys call it over there, but that's the first thing you said was, yeah, it's Chicago. That's not Gotham City. Uh, yeah, the elevated train. That's a loop. Uh, uh. It was probably the Spider-Man 2 
episode because I was like, oh, that's Chicago. That's not New York because yeah. I know what the elevated train system in Chicago looks like. Right. And sure enough, they filmed the the fight scene on the train here in Chicago, nice. not in New York, because New York doesn't have the same elevated train that goes through the city. Right. So, I mean, to be fair, you had an extra connection to it. Whereas folks living outside of Chicago or never having been there wouldn't have that connection. So that, that's, that must have made it better for, or did, did that hinder your experience or did that help you? It took me out of it in some ways because I still feel like, uh, one of the things that I love about the Burton movies is, um, Gotham feels like it's its own character because it, it, it it's, it has all of Tim Burton's, uh, moody set designs, uh, his color palettes and things. And, this movie, I feel like it just feels too grounded in reality sometimes. Mm. Interesting. I don't know if I ever would have said this is too grounded. To me, it's a perfect mix, but I can see where you come because you're right, dude. This looks nothing like the Tim Burton films at all. No. And I mean, hey, I, I get it. Uh, the story goes that the design for Gotham City was based on Chicago because it has a lot of Gothic architecture. Mm -hmm. Um so it's fine. If you're looking for a locale in a real city that feels like Gotham City, Chicago fits. Mm. Gosh, I never would have thought about that um, kind of taking you out of it. But I guess I could I guess I can understand where you're coming from. I mean, again, <laughs> make, well, you know, making it real. Dude, this is it's weird because like as comic book guys, we know that without Frank Miller, we may not have a Batman today. Let's be fair. Like yeah. he's the guy that made it that made it real, and the Dark Knight Returns made it very real. Like I've always kind of compared this to that in terms of, I mean, this movie feels like Batman Year One for a lot of reasons, and we've done that. Yes. We've done that in the in the archives here on the show, Phil. But like this movie did for the character what Frank Miller did in the books, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's really it's really more Dark Knight than this movie that I feel like it takes me out of it where I'm like this is this is Chicago. I mean there are parts of that movie uh like <laughs> like the scene with the Joker and he's riding up the street on the bat pod and he's shooting at him and I was like okay that's the financial district that's right up the street from where I work. Ah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah. That's uh like it, it is very, like you said. It's very grounded. It's there's landmarks there that you're going to recognize, of course. I mean, it's a different look for Gotham City. Can we say that starting out? Like we actually see Gotham City during the day, it, and we don't see yes. that a lot in the other movies, man. Yeah, but yeah, again, I th there are just different things I like about this franchise than those two Burton movies. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've always loved that uh, Gotham had its own character in that movie and how it felt very uh fantastical in some ways and it felt like you know stuff that you might see in a comic panel just didn't as as much feel that way for me mm, yeah. and that's not a bad thing it's just two different depictions sure yeah so this movie as it stands alone like can you compare and contrast and say that like, do you prefer this movie on a certain day versus the the Burton stuff? Or does this, do you have to be in a different mindset to watch? In other words, can you have this on the background like you could the 89 Batman? Uh, I, I just think it feels different uh, voids for me. I think uh, there are things that I like about this movie. Um, and there are things that I like about the 89 movie. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just two very different. I mean, it's just like right now, if I had to compare... Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming to the very first Raimi movie. Uh, there are just nostalgic things that I feel about the first Spider-Man movie mm. uh, that are different than Homecoming. And I really enjoy Homecoming, but they're just two different viewing experiences for me. And I feel the same way with this, where uh, you're never going to not get me to sit in front of a, uh, a TV and grin from ear to ear at Jack Nicholson uh, strutting through the museum as Joker. It's one of the greatest yeah. comic book movie scenes of all time. Yeah. Um, but this movie has other things that I just enjoy for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. They, uh, I love this movie and, and I haven't watched it in a bit, but I, I'll get your take on this as we start off. 
like there's some stuff in some of the Burton films that, you know, they're a moment in time when you look at it from a, a whimsical comic book, you know, uh, don't take yourself too seriously kind of aspect. It's fine. And it, those movies are classics. I get it. But like, yes. dude, a lot of this movie to me anyway, I got a hard time. I can poke holes in it. I can poke holes in anything. We all can. But man, dude, a lot of this movie really holds up for me personally. Like, do you get that thought on this or is it different for you? Yeah, I, I definitely do. Uh, uh, one more thing on just like the set design and everything. Yeah. Um, I think growing up, that's also what I really liked about Dick Tracy is that it felt very comic booky, like the color palettes and everything. Mm. And for for me, it was the same way with the initial Burton films. That was part of what I liked about it. Like uh, the way the Bat Batmobile looked, um, the way uh, just the movie felt, it was just different. This thing, it very much felt like we're trying to make a comic book movie that can take place in reality. Mm. And that's fine, but it's just a different uh, portrayal. Uh, but I think in a lot of ways, uh, what I love about this movie is it makes you connect with Bruce Wayne in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, by the end of the movie, because we spend almost an hour of screen time with Bruce Wayne before he ever puts on the suit. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. And I think that hour gets you to really connect with Bruce and understand uh, why he decided decided to be Batman. Um, it makes you understand a lot of his choices. It takes you through the entire thought process that he goes through to be Batman. I mean, it's really in a lot of ways the perfect origin movie for me. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I mean, even from the start of the movie and we find him uh, overseas and he's in that jail and just like this idea of building him back up to go back to Gotham. It's just so good. It's such great storytelling. It is. Uh, I mean, even the way they interlace the flashbacks in uh, to him being a kid, uh, it just hits you a different way. And again, I, uh, just the time period when I saw it, like I said, 2005, right after my mom passed. And I remember always uh, the scenes with Bruce. Of course, we've seen uh, the Crime Alley stuff numerous times now. Mm-hmm. But the thing that makes this this stuff with Crime Alley really work is because uh, we follow the stuff with Bruce getting up to that point. It's not just we get the flashback after he's Batman and we see him at Crime Alley with his parents dead. We get the stuff with his dad um, and his parents at home before that. We get the scene of why do we fall, Bruce, to learn to pick ourselves back up. We get all this stuff with him and Alfred to get you to connect with that that uh that circle he's in to think like really what could he have been if this didn't happen to him and he actually had his parents and he had a regular life. Yeah. And those and those short scenes we got, you immediately see like his family circle, his friend circle, and you see how this one traumatic incident really just crumbled everything and ruined his life. Um, it just changed everything. And the family's so likable too. They're not, you know, the dad's a billionaire, right? But he's not standoffish. He's not, he loves, you can tell he loves his kid. His, his, the mom seems normal. Like everybody's well adjusted too. It, it all hits you very different. Like, um, when we get, when we find out like he's in there, uh, you know, you get the different depictions of where they are are they at the opera are they seeing Zorro it always changes whether mm-hmm. or what you're seeing are they at the movies uh, but you know the whole thing is uh, Thomas is telling him you can't be afraid you always gotta be able to pick yourself up mm-hmm. and you know he's having a hard time because uh, he fell down that uh, well and he got scared by the bats he's having the nightmares about the bats and so he's still having like a hard time with it when they go to the opera that play and he's like can we go and his dad's just like yeah 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 and again it just makes you connect with thomas because he understands his kid and he's like yeah anything for you right you, you, you want to go let's go and so when he does when all everything does happen and all this stuff happens with joe chill and the way they film it is very good uh that shot of him sitting there on his knees and his parents are dead and it's just him alone in the alley shaking so very, very well done. 
But again, it just shakes me to my core every time I see it when he's sitting there and his dad's on the ground. And he's just like, Bruce, don't be afraid. It gets me every time, man. And I mean, when he's sitting in the police station and he meets uh, Jim Gordon for the first time and he's telling him it's going to be okay and he puts the coat on him. Oh. All of that stuff is just such great world building. The funeral, how they film all that stuff, even when they catch Joe Chill finally and all that stuff. And he's sitting there and the commissioner comes in and we and he's like, we got him. And Bruce is just sitting there with this blank stare on his face like, what does that mean? They're still gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't bring them back. It's not enough. It's 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 never going to be enough. Oh, and so yeah. He but to get all of that to the scene where he's sitting in the mansion and he's waving at uh uh Rachel from the window, and Alfred comes in and tells him, "I think I'm I'm thinking about making some dinner. Are you okay?" And he's he starts crying. He's like, "It's my fault if I." If I wouldn't have gotten afraid, they'd be still here. And I cry every time he says it. Yeah, I got choked up like, too. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's, again, it just, they do such a good job of making, bringing you into his world and understanding everything that he's going through. It's so good. Like you said, you build a relationship with Bruce before he ever puts a mask on. And, you know, at the end of this, Rachel, spoiler, Rachel flat out tells him, uh, you know, you're no longer Bruce. You're this other thing. You're that you're actually. And dude, Phil, I, I as a Marvel guy, I hate that line. I, I don't I don't care for it because to your point, we spent an hour getting used to, to to this Bruce Wayne and learning about his world and really liking this guy only to be told he's not that guy. He's Batman. Come on. Yeah. Well, I mean. That's really the journey we're supposed to be following. Yeah. And I it's not that I don't like that line because it is on it is what we're supposed to get to by the end of the, of the movie that you know, he had to make himself bigger than just Bruce Wayne. He had to make himself a symbol. And that's talked about it often in the movie. Um but I think it would have worked better if it was more show and not tell. Mm. You're never going to top that scene from Mask of Phantasm when um uh, Andrea leaves him and he realizes what he has to do because uh, we have the great scene of him sitting at the grave and he's just like, I didn't expect to be happy. It, it It's okay, right? It's okay. I, I, It's okay for me to just live my life. And so when she leaves him, he realizes there is nothing. There is, there is no Bruce Wayne. There is just the mission. Mm -hmm. And so you get that scene of him coming down there, putting the mask on for the first time and losing himself in it and Alfred not recognize him anymore. It is there. You're never going to get better than that scene. I don't care what you do. You're never going to top that scene. Such a great scene. What a great movie that is. Yeah. Mask of Phantasm is my favorite Batman movie by far. Yeah. Um, but I, I say that to say that, that they got it right in that moment because it was more show than the character actually telling you that. Kids, if you think that one's in the archives, you're right. We did that one too. Yeah, it's that one still holds up for sure. Like it's um again, like it's a different Batman, it's a different world. And dude, have we ever connected to a Bruce Wayne the way we've connected to Christian Bale here? I think in different ways. I mean I, I think you connect with the uh, Bruce in a new movie in a different way because you follow his story and his story is different. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think because you're, you, you get such a, you get such a great feel of who he could have been and what his world was before all of this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the stuff within the flashbacks when he comes back uh, from college or wherever he went as an adult and they do this thing with, uh, Act where they always have them have the bangs, and that's 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 them younger. It's so funny, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when he comes back from college and he's sitting in the uh court for Joe Chill's uh uh arraignment or whatever it is, and man, they do so many smart things with this movie. Uh, they they do this depth of field shot where they have the close-up on Joe Chill where the judge says, somebody's here from the Wayne family. Do you have anything to say? And you can see him standing up in the background. It never, like, focuses on him. It always had the focus on Joe Chill. Mm -hmm. You could just see, like, that silhouette of him in the background. And you just see him walk away. Um, 
so so good just such a smart shot uh and then the next week next time we see him uh he's standing in the hallway uh loading the gun getting ready to kill him yeah. um because he knows what he has to do they're not going to put nino brown in jail uh, he, he he has to go <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's, he's standing out there and man every time i see that thing this scene because i'm such a big batman fan and i just think what would make brutes desperate enough to use a gun because he hates guns right. that's a big part of his character he hates guns right um all the way to uh the very first episode of batman beyond the thing that made him hang up the cow for good is he got desperate enough to pick up a gun uh, to force the guy to get away from him because he was that scared that because he he was old he's beaten up uh, and so he felt like he had failed because he picked up a gun uh-huh. and this scene kind of does the same thing where he's ready to kill this guy with this gun and he gets shot by whoever Falcone sends in there and uh, he tells Rachel that I want a revenge I was going to kill him and we had a great scene of her slapping him and telling him your father would be ashamed of you, which was another made me tear up scene because it's just like, I get it. I get every, because you follow the whole story of him being so upset of what he took away from him and him feeling like this was it. This is all I have left is revenge. Right. And everything we know about Batman as a character, if you're desperate enough to use a gun, then you're failed. And in that moment, he realized I failed. I mean, look, in the hands of that other DC director, Maybe Bruce pulls that trigger, Phil. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. I mean, come on, man. Again, I could be just a Batman nerd and just I just think of the Frank Miller uh, panel all the time of him smashing the gun and saying, see this? This is the weapon of our enemy. This is a weapon of the weak. We don't use it. Yeah. Yeah, because to to the point that that this Bruce Wayne makes in this movie, like... You you can't stoop to that. You cannot stoop to that because it's not, you know, you, you have to be you, you like when he when he stands with Taraz Ter- Agul in the beginning, he he makes it known. You know, we I can't become that. We can't we we gotta be better than that, which he's right. Yeah, I'm not a killer. There's also this really great I feel like I'm like just uh referencing all this other Batman stuff, but we've had so much Batman material. Uh there's a there's a Gotham Knights uh, thing that takes place in between uh, this movie and Dark Knight. And it's kind of like uh, Animatrix mm-hmm. where they have all the animators do a different uh, Batman story. And the one I love is where he goes down in the sewer to catch that guy. And when he gets down there, he finds a gun that somebody threw down in the sewer and he picks it up with the plan to take it out of the sewer with him. And on the way out of sewer, he keeps finding more and more guns. He keeps picking them up, picking them up. And by the end of the short, uh, he's standing under the manhole, ready to climb out. But he's got like a handful of all of these guns. And he calls Alfred Dax for help because he doesn't want to leave the sewer with all of those guns, with just laying somewhere for somebody to find. But it's such a great, it's such a great shot of him standing there with like his arm full of all of these guns. And he he can't even get he can't even climb the ladder to get out of out of the uh, sewer because he's got a handful of these guns that he won't right. leave there. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, kids, we have said till we're blue in the face that you can all have your own opinions because entertainment is all subjective. But there's very few very few hills I will die on when it comes to this because again, you can disagree with me or Phil or whoever and not necessarily be wrong. But my Batman doesn't kill. And I've been told since I was a kid, Batman doesn't kill. A, a director can just, for a director to just come along and just make make out Phil, God, I'm going to rant too, make out as though none of that continuity means anything. We got to grow him up. We got to do scorched earth. Everything's got to be on fire. Everyone's got to be killing. Murder, 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 murder. And it's fine. I, I'm sorry. I If you want that and it's what you want, fine. But dude, that's not my Batman. So I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Call me crazy. I just think it goes against. I mean, even if you want to say that, uh, tell a story where he does kill. There are ways to do it. Um, but I don't think that he should ever use guns. He should never believe in guns because 
that one choice of a man with a gun changed his life forever. It ruined him. Yeah, for sure. It it took his innocence away. There's no way that he would ever believe in guns. That just goes against everything he stands for. Yeah. Well, speaking of the he, so we'll actually get into this film here a little bit because there's so much to talk about. But I think covering the stuff ahead of time makes a lot of sense. Christian Bale, I mean, you know, I've made the joke with you before that the Batman voice, which, by the way, in this movie anyway, it I, it, 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 it never jumped out at me. I never had a problem with it. I don't think that I'll have a problem in the next two movies, but maybe I'll be wrong. But like that voice has been ripped on and and like um, I forget the stand up comic that sort of made his own little shtick with it. He's a funny guy. Um, but it's just it's a thing that collegehumor.com did it for a while. And it's it's just mm-hmm. become a thing to just rip on that voice. And I've always asked the question, unless he uses a voice modulator, modulator like Affleck did. Like, what's he supposed to do, Phil? Just have a normal speaking voice? He's not Kevin Conroy. I mean, he he doesn't have, I assume, have that ability to change his tone. So they just had him growling like a demon, I guess. I mean, I still don't have a problem with that at all. Boink Studios is the home of Tom Clark's main event, Tom Clark's 6M podcast, and Two Nations Under Ted, a Ted Lasso podcast. Visit the site today for links to every podcast platform, social media, special announcements, and a lot more. Check out the site and bookmark today, boinkstudios.com. Christian Bale as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, dude, is just, Phil, you could argue he's too short. You could argue that, you know, maybe, maybe he's not the guy. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, he wasn't the first guy to audition as we, as we'll get into here. But overall, what do you think about Christian Bale as Batman? I love him as Batman because, again, we connect with this Bruce Wayne because we follow his story from the very beginning. Um, we follow like the building blocks that made him who he was, his journey uh, to go and find himself and come back and start the mission that would make him who he is. Uh and he does a great job throughout all of it. You know, he does a great job of at some points playing, you know, the vengeful, angry guy, uh, the guy that is lost. Uh, he does it all very well. And even when he comes back, he has this confidence and uh, the subdued humor to him. That's great. Uh, I think he's fantastic in a role. The growl never really bothered me. I think that it's it's become overused as a joke in some ways. Uh, but I really appreciated that this movie was the first one to say, no, no, he's so dedicated to this that he would change his voice because this is one of the most famous people in the entire world. Uh, he's a he's a billionaire. So, of course, he would not just use his regular speaking voice. Um, and of course, we got that in the animated series as well. Kevin Conroy differentiated his voice. Um, but this was I felt like the first movie where they really got into it and they really expressed it in a. In a in a believable way they all this is also the first movie that depicted the bruce wayne stuff where bruce wayne is really the mask and batman is who he really is Mm. um all of the stuff with him where he is uh intentionally trying to think make people think that he's this uh billionaire playboy and a lush and all these other things and meanwhile he doesn't actually drink he drinks ginger ale um i thought all of that stuff the way they handled in this movie was very good. Mm-hmm. Um, all the practicality and stuff when he comes back and we see him put together his arsenal and his suit and everything. Also very, very good. I mean, dude, they found real world explanations for the utility belt, for the gauntlets, for the car, dude, for the for the grappling hooks, for everything. It was great. Yeah. Uh, all of the stuff in Wayne R- uh, uh, RD department and uh <laughs> i love that he's like trying to make up all these excuses like yeah i, I need it for spelunk and all of this other stuff and mm-hmm. lucius fox is like sir this is your stuff anyway like <laughs> yeah it's yours anyway like you're not really stealing it which i thought was also a good scene where uh he tries to get into the mind of a criminal and uh he steals all that stuff from the truck and the police officer is like you're a criminal he's like i'm not a criminal he's like well 
Tell that to the guy you stole these things from. We got in a box that is from it's his stuff. It's, it's, his from, stuff. Wayne, yeah. it's from Wayne Enterprises. That's so good. That's so good. He's uh yeah, I mean I again, man, like the the idea that we we were able to connect to Christian Bell's Bruce Wayne, I think was a huge, huge plus for this movie and for this franchise. And I think it it boded well for what Chris Nolan wanted to do here. I mean, dude, right. Listen, Ralph Batfield, you got a great actor in the lead role and you've got one of the most acclaimed directors of his time in Chris Nolan. I mean, you're already starting off on the right foot here, man. What a combination to start off this new Batman franchise. Yeah. Yeah. And you're getting a guy in a uh, Christian Bale who's played notable roles. Of course he was in American psycho before that. Um, it played a corporate type. So you can already get with this idea of him as a corporate guy with a dark side or like a secret, mm-hmm. but just in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit different. <laughs> yeah, man, that's a messed up movie. I haven't seen that one in years, to be honest. Uh, messed up flick from what I can remember. But uh, yeah, he's, and dude, David S. Goyer, who's done a lot of Batman stuff in his time, man. That's right. Um, Nick Fury, Agent of Shield in '98. He did the Blade trilogy. Um, he did the Dark. I guess he he did all three movies of the Dark Knight trilogy here. So that's pretty cool. Uh, good writer, man. Um, I think he knows his stuff, and as obviously he knows his stuff, and he knows what he's doing. I mean, I, I think Christian Bale is. I, I listed my favorite Batman, but I just can't imagine anyone else uh, in in this. I, I just and we talk about that a lot here on the show about castings that could have been, I mean, a uh, Killian Murphy audition for Bruce Wayne. And if you haven't seen those clips, kids, they're on the YouTube. He looks great. Would he have been great? I think he would have been fine. He does have a dark edge to him. There's something behind his eyes. That's dark. And, you know, I, I, I think that's just his personality, not his personality, but it's just his look maybe, but you know, it wasn't a good fit Phil, and They cast him, as somebody else here, but you know, we could have had Killian Murphy as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, which I would he have done well. Sure. But man, look at Bale, dude. When it's great. Y- yeah. I mean, Bale just, he embodies who this guy is. Like again, if, if you told, if, if no one had ever heard of, of a Batman before and you gave this to somebody, that person would have said, well, You know, there's some special effects shenanigans going on, but yeah, I can kind of see this actually happening because that's how it feels. It feels like from the ground up, they built not maybe rebuilding, but well, maybe like rebuilding the idea of Batman from the ground up to make him not only like he's, he's relevant, of course, but you can, you can, you know, in some ways you can relate to him. He seems like a real person. I mean, I think kind of maybe that's Christian Bale as an actor, man. Like he can play those far out characters, but he can also play somebody that seems very humble at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that he he does all everything that uh, Nolan needed him to do. Uh, he feels like a convincing leading leading man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he does have that like dark side to him. Uh, he fits the build. And early on when, you know, they're building him up and he's doing all the montage scenes of him training. And even in a suit, he looks great in a suit. Uh, I think he's great. He's one of my favorite Batman. What do you think about the suit, by the way, compared to the uh, others? The next always going to be. <laughs> yeah. Next always going to be an issue. Um, I I personally like the suit from this movie more than I like the Dark Side Dark Knight movie. Mm. Uh, I like that the the mask in the, the next movie is its own separate piece, so he can move his neck, mm-hmm. and that is a big part of uh, the movie. But um, I just like how this suit looks. I look at, I like how the cape looks. Um, I like how they made a point to explain uh, why the cape can drape and then form like wings later Mm. uh i like i like the practicality of it uh i like i like i like this look i think it's great uh the first time we see him um when uh he comes to rachel's aid in the subway right 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, he's he's perched up on that ledge, and she tries to hit him with the taser, and he's got the cape flowing in the background. It looks so good. So good. Yeah. And uh, I love how it's very close to what the ninjas were wearing with Ra's al Ghul when he was there. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of the stuff that he incorporates into his into the Batman persona is equipment that he's either familiar with or he's already used or that's close to what he's done and stuff that he has to be comfortable wearing. I think a lot of that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So if you're going to nail Bruce Wayne, Phil, you have to nail Alfred. It's important. You know, we, we know Michael Gow, which, uh, in the original uh, Tim Burton Batman movies is fantastic. He's more of a grandfatherly type, but he's great. And, you know, you've got here as Alfred Pennyworth, of course, Sir Michael Caine. Dude, it is for an actor of this stature to become Alfred in an, in a series of new Batman films is, I don't know if we expected this when it happened, but man, what a legend. and. Phil, you don't have to worry about can he hold his own on the screen next to the dude playing Batman because he absolutely could take over any scene he wanted to, but he's doing his bit here as Alfred, man. Is this the best Alfred that you've seen on the screen in live action? It's definitely one of my favorite. I mean, I think in order to get Batman right, you're right that uh, Alfred has to be a, a big part of the movies. Um, it's funny because uh, I think that that's one of the things that they get right in Batman and Robin, that the Alfred in that movie is so good and mm-hmm. makes you care. Uh, of course, I always think of Clooney walking in the room and he's like, Alfred's dying. <laughs> they have that dramatic music behind him. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's right. A bad movie. <laughs> God, I've tried to Such forget bad, it. Yeah. Such a bad movie. Uh, but... Also, whenever I think of the 60s Batman, I was a big fan of that show. I used to watch it every day when I came home from school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think of the Alfred from that and just how like different he was and just how charming and like uh, he just brought like this different vibe. And it was kind of the same thing with uh, what we got with Jeremy Irons when he, he ended up taking over the role with uh, Affleck. But Michael Caine is different, man. Michael Caine is fantastic, man. He, like you said, can hold his own. Uh, uh, he can be witty and funny, uh, but he also can monologue and chew up some scenery. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's fantastic. I would say it's tough, man, because some of it is nostalgia. So it's tough for me to say that he's my favorite Alfred. But I think in terms of like the best actor that they've got to play Alfred. It's probably really Michael Caine. I mean, because um, th- he does too many monologues that make you think like, nah, he's he's the best. Like, of course, everybody always does the impression of him telling the story about uh, uh, the the thieves in the in the ruby mm-hmm. the second movie, mm-hmm. and telling the story that sometimes people just like to see things burn. But again, when we got the scene where Bruce as a kid was saying, it's my fault. Like I, I, if I wouldn't have been afraid, if I wouldn't have wanted to leave, this wouldn't have happened. But it, that scene, it works so well because not only does it get you to connect with Bruce, but it gets you to immediately connect with Alfred because he says all the right things in that moment. Uh, it never feels like uh, all of this stuff is thrusted on Alfred and he doesn't know what to do. Uh, he always is a steady uh, voice of, of reason for him. He's always his conscience. He's always, he's always doing what he needs to do. He's the perfect confidant for him mm. and father figure. And like I said, again, if you don't connect with Bruce early on in those scenes and you don't get those scenes where Alfred is immediately there to comfort him and immediately there to fill all of his needs. Um, I think that this movie isn't as successful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Again, I think you have to nail, of course you have to nail Bruce and Batman, but I do think you have to nail Alfred. That is uh, Alan Napier from the TV series. He is great, dude. He kind of reminds me of my great-grandfather anyway. So, Yeah, he's great. But Alfred, man, he has so many great scenes in this movie. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the, the, the scene where he comforts Bruce um, when he was a kid. Uh, when we finally see Alfred again, 
uh, when he makes his way back to Gotham and they're on the plane and he's uh, he's filling him in on everything. He said, well, you're dead. And he's just like, oh, well, you know, I'll let you drive to Royce. Yeah. Sure you fill it up again. <laughs> uh, great. And he, he has so many comedic lines like that don't that don't feel out of place because um, they reward you. They reward you for so many scenes, like a scene where he gets out of bed every morning and he's doing the push ups and he's buried under that rubble and he's trying to help him get it off. And he's like, what's the use of all of those bloody push ups if you can't lift the load? <laughs> so good. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And, you know, the moments where he has to keep he has to keep Bruce on track. And, you know, Bruce shows up at his own birthday party. He doesn't want to be there. And he's like, you know, I don't care about this. And he he basically tells him, you need to care about this, you know, because your father's name is the only thing that's left of him. This is the last thing that's left of him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you know what I mean? Like he keeps him grounded. Yeah, again, he he's that voice of reason. He's his conscious. And he does monologue, but all of his monologues, um, it feels like, it's that stiff kick that, that Bruce needs. Uh, even when he comes back and he's all sulky and he, he's upset and he's like, I don't care about this stuff. And he's like, and or he's like, well, what do you care? He was like, I should care. Your father left me the thing that meant the most thing to him in this world. And yeah. I'm not going to just give up on you. Man, what about when Bruce comes back from college and they're on the staircase and he tells him, what do you care? It's not your family. I'm right. Like, That's the thing I'm talking about where he's like, like he was he again he was being so like bratty and and mean to him and Alfred never gets out of pocket with him he always says what he needs to hear right, in that right. moment yeah yeah jeez i i had forgotten how of course you know he's a he's a younger bruce he's still very angry a uh, lot of rage within him you can tell so i mean you know you forgive that stuff but man i'd forgotten how cold he sounded to him uh yeah, they get into a few fights in this trilogy. And they're such compelling fights. Um, because uh you could see Bruce's motivation, you could see his anger and mm-hmm. all of these other things. And Alfred never backs down. He's just like, Well, no, you know, I'm here to do a job, but also like, you know, your father would have hated this. He would have hated everything you're doing. Yeah. Um, I I always think about, um, I, there's a lot of things that I don't like about that third movie, but their fight when he leaves the, the mansion is so good. Yeah. I mean, again, the, the right guy got casted here and you know, I didn't mind Jeremy Irons. Uh, he's a different kind of Alfred. Yeah. I think he's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It was going to be hard to follow up Michael Caine, but he was exceptional. Yeah. So, Let's talk about the heavy and there's a, there's a few different heavies in here, which is good because I think they keep them all in perspective and one kind of out, doesn't outweigh the other till the end, I suppose. But, you know, Raza Ghul here is Liam Neeson. Once again, skating the different universes. He's already in Star Wars universe, as we know. And, you know, there's a lot of wonky stuff about, about him that's happened since this movie a lot of wacky stuff he said, which is beyond weird. And I'm not saying that, you know, this guy's perfect behind the scenes. Don't know him, never met him. But I kind of feel like his mouth just tends to get him in trouble a lot because he says weird stuff, which doesn't make any sense to me. But he is Henry Ducard in this movie and then later becomes, or we find out as Ra's al Ghul. I mean, dude, he is... Again, Phil, when Michael Caine's on the screen, you know it's a like that's an actor. Like you just know it. Like when Liam Neeson's on the screen, you know that's an actor. I mean, this guy is great in everything he does, basically, and he's the villain here. What do you think about this casting? What do you think about him in this movie? Oh, he's great. He's great in this movie. Uh, every time I think and I watch this movie, and they pronounce his, his name Raz al Ghul I always think of the animated series and how it's pronounced in animated series and because that was my introduction to the character I always say it the way they said an animated series which is Ra's al Ghul right. and so I every like I, during this movie I was like his name's Ra's al Ghul it's not Raz al Ghul um, but again but nerdy stuff <laughs> uh, it's same uh, same yeah 
But yeah, I I think he's great in this movie. He brings the right presence to it. He brings the right coldness and in intimate moments he feels uh very believable. Uh because we kind of see him also kind of try to take on like this father figure role to him as well. Mm-hmm. Um, when he's training him and giving him advice, but what a guy, man! Uh, Liam Neeson trained Batman, trained Obi Wan Kenobi. It's right, yeah. And he'll find you. Yeah, he'll, he'll find, find you. you. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a guy! Uh, but he's fantastic in this. I know some people were not a fan of Rachel Gould being white, um, and they felt like they had whitewashed the role, um, and they wanted someone of Middle Eastern descent. And that's why when we do see the Ra's al Ghul uh, early in the movie, that's the bald guy, it makes you think, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cause, mm. And, you know, Liam Neeson's character is just one of his followers. He's just one of the, the members of the Leagues of Shadows, mm. which, boy, the way that I popped in the theater and nerded out that the League of Shadows was actually in the movie. Like, the first time they called it the League of Shadows, I was like, they're actually doing it. So um, cool. Um, but yeah, it, I, that didn't really ever rub me the wrong way, uh, because Liam Neeson was so good in the role. Of course, I would like to see, uh, someone of Middle Eastern descent, uh, because it's such a big part of the character, but eh, it didn't really bother me. I think he fit the role well. They, they found a way to fit in his, his beard it, that looks very much like Ra's al Ghul's in the comic and in animated series. Uh, but he's great. He he's like I said he's he's great in the intimate scenes early in the movie. He's cold. He's uh <laughs> he's very uh forthright. Uh, it's so funny because I always connect certain things with Liam Neeson and Phantom Menace. Menace. Uh, Phantom Menace is not a great movie. Uh, uh but Qui Gon Jinn is a great character and. He's one of the most important characters to Star Wars mythos in a lot of ways. And so even when you were saying this guy's done some things that we're not a proud of, and I just immediately thought of uh Obi-Wan saying, You're not gonna defy the you're not gonna f- defy the Jedi again. He's like, I'll do what I must. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, I man, he's but he's great in this movie, man. Uh he gets moments where everybody kind of gets this moment where they do something that's comedic and it never feels like it's out of place. Mm. So he has very witty retorts for Bruce sometimes, but uh, none of it feels out of character. Um, man, we see him the second time in this movie where the lady introduced him to Bruce. And he's like, yeah, somebody wants to meet you. It's like, it's, it's racial cool. And he goes, Rach is dead. And it ends up being Liam. And he turns around in the black suit. Such a great reveal. I love how he stood there where the woman could hear him and he goes, I watch Ross Ghul die. I'm like, you say it. she's right there. Like <laughs> I'm sure she was very confused by everything that was sure. happening. Like, oh well, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. I'm gonna walk away now. Uh, and they do that they do that twice in this uh trilogy, by the way, because we get uh uh Force Ghost, uh, Rachel Cool in the third movie. That's <laughs> right. Shadows, and he's great. What uh, What do you think about about the choice to put him aside? Because when we went to see this, like, you assume he's not dead. We're comic book fans. We know the character. They probably didn't kill him. But for all we knew, Phil, they were saving him to a second movie. Maybe he'd pop up in the, in the post credit scene or something. But like, what do you think about the choice of saving him till the end of the third act? I thought that that was a great reveal. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was a very, very good plot twist. Um, I hate how he dies in this movie, by the way. I don't like it at all. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah, the whole, I don't have to save you. Like, I'm just like, but Batman wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't he just save him? He saved him early in the movie. Yeah. And I get it's supposed to be symmetry that... Uh, he made the choice to save him, and it came back to bite him in the butt because he then came back and burned down his house. But uh, which he also points out, and he's like, "Yeah, good piece of symmetry." It's last time I saw you, you burned down my house and left me for dead. Mm. Now I return the favor. Uh, but yeah, I, I hate that whole scene of him going, "Well, I don't have to save you, but I'm not going to kill you." Well, you you basically did kill him. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I ranted when we just earlier about the fact that my Batman doesn't kill. I mean, would that scene have made better sense if he had if he had found like if he had said you got one chance to get out of here and I'm giving it to you and then he's and then he's out, then he's out. And maybe, you know, Liam Neeson's character struggles to whether it's an open window or it's a grappling hook or something and he can't get it to work and then he dies. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't really like that ending for Rafe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and plus, dude, it's it's a thing that became probably, some, well, not so much now, but it's a thing that became in those movies. It was like, you kill the villain at the end of the movie. And it happened a lot. You killed the Joker. You killed uh, the Penguin. You just kept killing villains. I'm like, why are we still killing villains here? Yeah, it, I think it also very much stood out because he did not kill joker at the end of his movie he made the choice not to kill joker at the end of dark knight love it love it because he wanted them to and you can't do it because again batman's not a murderer kids in case we hadn't made that abundantly clear to you let's talk about the love interest because i can't wait to hear what you think about this um we don't get vicky vale this time we get rachel Dawes, and it's katie holmes and as we know, she did not return for the second movie and was replaced with Maggie, Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, what do you think about Dawson's Creek here as Rachel Dawes? Uh, I think she's good. I think she fills the role. I actually think she's the better Rachel Dawes. Agreed. Um, she just kind of feels more believable in the role. Um. Yeah, I enjoy her in this movie. Mm-hmm. I, I, she is uh, sorely missed in the second movie. And that's not to say that Maggie uh, does a bad job, but it's just so distracting. I don't know why. It's just distracting. I don't think it helped that they tried to make her look very, very much like her. Like, I almost kind of wish they'd cast a blonde or something where it's just, don't. hey guys, don't get caught up in how she looked. This is going to be a different actress playing the part. Yeah. I don't know. Here's what I'll say about it. I don't dislike Katie Holmes. To me, she doesn't make a huge impact until the second movie. Because to your point, the fact that she's not in that, it, it's I, I notice it, and no, nothing against Maggie Gyllenhaal, I don't think it was the proper replacement, in my opinion. But I, I kind of didn't know how much I liked Katie Holmes in this movie until she wasn't in the second one, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I enjoy her in the first movie. And... Like I said, she was missed in a second movie. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, uh, by the way, where do we stand with her and uh, Tom Cruise? Did she, like, because I have no idea. Like, she found... Very weird. Yeah. Very weird Scientologist stuff. uh, Yeah. Very weird that it seemed like part of the reason she wasn't in the second movie is that uh, she stopped acting. It seemed like that was linked to some stuff with their marriage. I don't know all of the specifics, but a lot of weird stuff going on there. Man, there's a uh, Scientology documentary, and I'm trying to remember where it's at, what streamer it's on. Is it the HBO one that came out a few years ago? No. The, oh, uh, maybe that it is. That one's very good. Yeah. Uh, I think it's called like Going Clear or something like that. Oh, gosh, I don't know. There may be a couple uh, of them. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, but that documentary, though, that was on HBO. Um, if that's not the one you're talking about, it's also good. Mm. Yeah. I mean, let's hope she got away from it. i tell you, I, I did feel for her during the height of, of that madness. Um, cause I kept thinking, yeah. man, that's, they got her, man. Like they got her cause of him. Like Tom Cruise is so completely absorbed into that stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. The one that I'm thinking of is uh going clear Scientology and the prison of belief. Mm. Um, that's a 2015 documentary. Um, and that one is very good. I think the one I saw was much newer than that one. They focused a lot on Travolta and then Cruz, and then they talked to some people who actually got out. I mean, it was, yeah, it's freaking nuts. Freaking nuts what those people believe in over there. Um, we talked about Killian Murphy. You know, we haven't got a scarecrow since Killian Murphy. And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't get like the typical, you know, full costume from head to toe, but we didn't really need to because that wasn't necessary. I love the idea of he's using fear toxin on, on uh, you know, patients in Arkham 
and he's using the mask as a way to to funnel and like to to make the, more of an impact during these sessions. But this is not a good guy. He's not here to help anybody. He's a villain in every sense of the word. He's actually working for Roz at the same time, and we don't know that till later. We just find out that he's working for somebody. We find out the end who it is. I mean, like I said earlier, Phil, can you imagine Killian Murphy in the role of Batman instead of Christian Bale? Yeah, I think he would have fit, especially you're going for a younger Batman. You're doing the year one take. Mm-hmm. I think he would have fit. Uh, you know, he ended up doing pretty well for himself. He's also had some pretty big roles since then. Um. But yeah, I think he's great at this. He's the right amount of uh, creepy and weird. Uh, the first time we see him, it's like, yeah, there's kind of something unsettling about this guy. This guy kind of feels like a serial killer. Mm. <laughs> but he's fantastic. And uh, fear and overcoming your fear is such a big theme in this movie. Weaponizing your fear is such a big... Weaponizing fear against the villains is such a big theme. It's a big part of Batman's mythos. So it makes it makes sense if you're going to do that in this movie to bring in Scarecrow. Scarecrow was such a big part of the animated series. Uh, and that was my first introduction with him. Um, so many great episodes of the animated series focused around Scarecrow. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what a great character. And so I was very glad we finally saw him on the big screen. I thought that this was great casting for him. Um, I love the usage of the fear toxin in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I also love that they explain the practicality of it uh, and have that they have the explanation from the League of Shadows and that flower that uh, Bruce goes to collect during his training. And yeah. They use that and that eventually becomes the toxin. Um, I thought that was smart because it tied everything together. It tied the first half of the movie into the Rachel Ghoul stuff and it made sense that the two of them would be linked because of that. It's yeah, dude, tying everything together. It's so brilliant. I think he's the perfect villain for this movie too. Yeah. I think he fits the themes of the movie perfectly. Uh, and he's such a non-threatening guy in some ways. Um, I don't really buy him uh, beating Batman uh, in a hand to hand fight. Uh but he's <laughs> the first time that he sees Batman in the suit and he was like, man, you look like a guy that takes yourself too serious. Yeah. You lighten up, <laughs> light them on fire. I thought that that was great. Yeah. There's uh, like the depictions of, of, of the fear toxin as well are very, very unsettling. Oh, um, man, the yeah. first time we see him use it in, in the scarecrow's mask, it's very unsettling. Uh, th- what villains look, think that Batman looks like, Induced by the fear toxin. Also very unsettling. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And like, dude, the biggest mistake Scarecrow made in this movie was spraying Batman with that toxin because he didn't know who he was dealing with because Bruce took it and figured it out. And like, re- you know what I mean? Like, that's the worst thing he could have done. Didn't even know he did the wrong thing here. Yeah. Which was a theme, again, throughout the animated series of him overcoming fear. Um, in episodes with the Scarecrow, I thought they did kind of the same thing here, and it worked really well. Mm. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> the scenes where he's in the back seat and uh, Alfred comes and picks him up, and he's hallucinating because of the fear toxin, he's muttering to himself. <laughs> so good, uh, unintentionally funny at times. Yeah, yeah, he. Uh, I I love Killian Murphy in this. I think he's fantastic. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. And I think it fits. I, I thought it was a bit of where does he come back? Is it part three? He shows back up again, or yeah, he's the judge in that underground that's right. uh, courtroom. Yeah, that was weird to me. I don't know. 
Very weird. It was cool to see him again, though. Sure. Again, he's a good fit, like you said. Uh, it makes sense for him to be in this. He's the right kind of villain for this movie. I think everything works. I, I honestly don't have any issue with that at all. Uh, Tom Wilkinson is Carmine Falcone. I mean, dude, we've seen Tom Wilkinson's been a lot of stuff. He was the heavy in the first rush hour. He's done multiple other things through the years that, you know, we probably don't have time to name them all now. I mean, the guy has done a lot of stuff. Um, uh, he's in the Patriots. Um, let's see the importance of being earnest in 2002. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, Exorcism of Emily Rose is the movie he did after this. A uh, lot of stuff, Phil. I mean, uh, he was in Michael Clayton. He's done a lot of things. And uh, he's great. I, you kind of feel like the accent's not real, but I don't care because he's such a believable and a villain and such an easy-to-hate guy when he plays the heavy. And... Mm-hmm. I don't know if we even got enough of him in this movie, dude. I thought he was great. Yeah, as a big fan of uh, Long Halloween and uh, Dark Victory, which they played on a, on that a bit here. Uh, Long Halloween is used a lot more as uh, the inspiration for Dark Knight. Mm. And so I was happy to see Valcone in this uh, and see some of the... Uh, mobsters that they had in those books used in the movies because we didn't get as much of that in some of the early Batman movies. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy to see a depiction of Falcone here. He was great. Uh, The scenes early on where he's talking to Bruce when Bruce comes in there and uh, confronts him, all very good stuff. And I mean, when he's, he's talking to trash to him, like, nah, this is real power. I could, I could kill you right here and nobody would do anything. Yeah. And, I mean, he's just, he's giving it to him. He is like, man, you come down here. You think we're supposed to be impressed. You don't know anything about this world. Like, you don't belong here. Yeah. He's like, you know, when Chill killed your old man, he begged for his life like a dog. Begged. And he's like really emphasizing. <laughs> it's like, man, this guy's such a terrible person, dude. Yeah, he's he was fantastic in those scenes. Yeah. Um, and Bruce is just seething with that that little bit of blood dripping from his lip. Yeah, just like oh. seething, so good. It's awesome. He's uh, yeah, again, just so easy to hate here. Um, and you know he 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 got he got his comeuppance. Um, I'm trying to remember. Did we see him again at any other point? Any of the other? Because I'm really blanking. I, the part two I remember quite a bit, but part three not so much. Oh, we don't really see him that much we get the other mobster in the second movie mm. yeah yeah you're right you're right you're right yeah yeah yeah. and we don't really see falcone again after uh scarecrow terrifies him in that room right right yeah yeah he's done mess with him he's done messed him up <laughs> hit him with the toxin man that'll do it would you like to see my mask yeah dude that line is so from out of nowhere every time i see that moment it takes me out of the scene entirely. It feels a bit hokey, but yeah. it's fine. Yeah. It's definitely a comic book line. And no other kind of movie, I think, could you get a line like that. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. It's a big criticism of the Nolan movies is we get a lot of exposition uh, from some mm. of the bad guys that doesn't feel all that natural. Yeah. But, you know, it's fine. It's a comic book movie. Comic book movie. We also know that Carmine Falcone is a big time player in the books. And again, I love Phil. I I always equate this movie much more to Batman year one than I do anything else, honestly. And he's a big player in that book as well. It's really good. Yeah. You could see uh, that year one really inspired this movie. And like I said, long Halloween was really the uh, inspiration for the second movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we also have uh I'm saving one of the the best to last here. Rutger Hauer is William Earl. Kids, if you've ever seen an eighties action film or an eighties drama or like a any kind of like uh big blockbuster film, the box office and you need a villain, Rutger Hauer is probably the guy. And we're hero. He could do either one. But he's the CEO of Wayne Enterprises. Phil, this guy's slimy. You can tell he's got his own agenda. Turns out he's on the take like everybody else is in this whole freaking town. Gotham City's dirty from the top, you know, from top to bottom. 
but he's great in this movie, dude. He he just Rutger Hauer doing Rutger Hauer stuff is always going to be effective because he's just so believable, man. Yeah, I think he's great. I think it made a lot of sense for uh, Bruce to come back and battle corruption. Of course, the corruption would seep into Wayne Enterprises because that's Gotham City. Gotham finds a way to co- corrupt everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, and this guy's definitely dirty. Let's see. Also, in a, not a very big role, he's uh, the decoy Raza Ghoul as Ken Watanabe, which I hate he didn't get more to do, Phil, but we kind of killed him really early. And you know something, Phil? We should have known that something was up. Like, if you didn't know anything about this guy, about who Raza Ghoul was supposed to be or whatever, should have known something was up because when the when the place is falling down around them, Bruce gets, gets the best of this guy like three times. Beats him. Beats him pretty easily, and yes. um, we immediately see the body because usually when they do this, where they kill a main villain, and we know they're eventually going to come back, um, we don't see the body. We saw this body immediately. They were like, "Yep, oh, yeah, he's dead. Yep, cool." <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, what, which would have been fine because I would have very much liked the scene where if Liam Neeson was not Raish, where he comes and explains it. And we get a whole flashback of him carrying him into some tunnels and putting him in a Lazarus pit. I would have popped really Oh, wow. It. That's awesome. Too far out for the first movie. Yeah. Lazarus pit to me in a Superman movie is fine. In a Flash movie, sure. A dude in a Batman movie, it just doesn't feel like it belongs. Man, I would have popped very hard for if we saw a Lazarus pit scene. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, again, so grounded in reality, and then we followed up with the Lazarus Pit. Yeah. But, I mean, we technically get a interpretation of the Lazarus Pit in the third movie, which I didn't really like. Yeah. Yeah, same. I'm saving this guy to the last, because without Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox, still a great character name, by the way, but Phil, without Alfred and Lucius, this Batman experiment for this guy named Bruce Wayne, Phil, maybe doesn't end without him getting killed. Do you know what I mean? Like, Lucius is fantastic. Morgan Freeman is the man. Morgan Freeman, everything he does is gold. Absolutely perfect casting as Lucius. Absolutely great character to help Bruce during this crusade, if we can call it that. You can't get much better than Morgan Freeman in this movie, man. Yes. The thing that I love about this movie so much, when they do build the supporting characters for Bruce, is that um in his journey to come back and fight the corruption of Gotham um the league of shadows and race is telling him like Gotham is beyond saving like mm-hmm. it's 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 completely corrupted it's completely taken over by violence and crime there is no saving it um but one of the big themes of this movie is that one person can make a difference and the thing that his dad tried to impress onto him early in the movie is that um doesn't matter who we are, um, people matter. Mm. And the peace of people of Gotham um will always be that glimmer of hope in that city. And people like Lucius or or Rachel and all of these good intentional people, Gordon, all of these people um are the people that saved um Bruce for really being swallowed up by the darkness of the city, Mm. both in the flashbacks and in present day. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I love that Lucius has kind of figured this out from the beginning. And like Lucius never had to be told this guy's Batman because he's way more than figured that out. But yeah, he he, (laughs) he never mentions it. He never really. He's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. I don't don't pretend that I'm stupid, but we don't have to talk about it. (laughs) That's a great line, too. What a great line. Yeah, he's fantastic in this movie, man. I mean, it's 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 freaking Morgan Freeman. He's again, he's great in everything he does. I mean, he is absolutely perfect in this. We also Legend. yeah. For oh dude, for sure. Great casting. Dude, before we get to anybody else, like in one movie, you have Michael Caine, you got Morgan Freeman, and you got Liam Neeson in one movie, not even mentioning Christian Bell's name. That's that's wacky to me, man. Yeah, we also have the great uh, Gary Oldman as well. Great casting. Got to mention Gary Oldman, yeah. Talk about saving the last to the last. Gary Oldman 
as Commissioner Gordon. Dude, we talked about the Batman Year Year One influence, and he is absolutely Jim Gordon. He looks just like him, man. Mustache and everything, okay. his haircut, he's perfect. Um, again, ah, the, the flashbacks, uh, you immediately uh, connect with Commissioner Gordon in those scenes with young Bruce. He's so great in those early so scenes. Great. Um, he's great later in the movie. Uh, he's another one that he gets his monologues, uh, famously gets his monologue in the second movie, the end of the movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's he's so great in this movie. Uh, he's another one where he's just that bright spot that makes you want to believe that people can be better. Mm. Yeah, he is. Uh, God, he's so good here. I mean, again, say Freeman and Oldman to last because it's, yeah. Now imagine the movie with just those guys um, and you, you've got a whole movie. Like, but now they're in this Batman film again. Feel like you're legitimizing, and look, we don't we don't need that. I didn't need it then. I don't need anyone anyone to validate what I love. I mean, maybe I did in the eighties. Sure, it would have been nice to have great comic book movies. We didn't really get them, but it would have been awesome. I mean, the the gap from the first Superman to Batman eighty nine was pretty pretty darn long. So it would have been great to have something, but like Phil, I'm past the point at this age of needing validation for the stuff that I love. But man, when I get a comic book movie filled with heavyweights, when I get Robert Redford in a Captain America movie, you got my attention. Like that's pretty <laughs> freaking impressive, man. Yeah. I think this was very well casted. Um, the acting was very good in this movie. Uh, very well written. Um, mm. Again, just the perfect origin story for Batman. They don't give us a lot of stuff we've already seen. I think it was important to come out the gate and not give us Joker straight away. Give us new villains. Um, give us villains that very much fit the theme of this origin. Mm -hmm. um, and Ra's al Ghul made a lot of sense, especially with the connections uh, to League of Shadows and the stuff that they did there. Um, his his plan is uh, it's a little bit wonky. It's it's very comic booky, but yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and the plan is to distribute this fear toxin throughout the water supply. But wait, you can't get it from drinking it. You get it because it's inhaled through your lungs. They steal this piece of Wayne tech that will, you know, evaporate all the water in the pipes, causing it to go airborne, which means everybody will go banana, um, getting the fear toxin in their system. So there you go. Yes. Which is it Gotham city already kind of messed up as it is like, but I guess that's the idea is to turn it into such utter chaos that it just destroys itself. Yes. Because we've established, Phil, in the DC universe, New York doesn't exist because Gotham City's there. Gotham City is New York in the DC universe, right? Is it? I think. Uh... Because, like, you know, they mention, they mention Rome and Constantinople. Like, when certain cities get too big, you got to wipe them out. And I'm like, you mean to tell me that Gotham City's bigger? Like... How can Gotham City be bigger than New York? Where is it located? Where is it in the world, in the country, if it's not New York? You know what I mean? That's a good question. I've never really thought about how these things are analogs for like real cities. Mm -hmm. Because what is Metropolis in? Is Metropolis not New York? It's a great question. I don't know. I don't I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's the DC got, thing, right? Like yeah, I guess Metropolis always kind of felt felt more Midwestern because it's close enough to Kansas. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know where it would be. That's that's interesting. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I the 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 plot's a little yeah the 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 master plan in other words is a little wonky for sure. We have to mention Mark Boone Jr. as Arnold Flass. Uh, if you kids know anything about uh, Sons of Anarchy, you know this guy. Basically, has had the same look forever. Uh, <laughs> good actor. What did you think about the choice to make Flash not the big, tough, you know, good-looking jock from the Batman Year One book? Did you care that they changed it? Because it was kind of a shock to me. It was like, wait, that's Flash? No, it didn't bother me. Yeah. It felt like he had some vibes of uh, Bullock from the animated series. Oh, yeah. Good call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also had Linus Roach uh, as Thomas Wayne. 
Great job of this guy. I thought he looks enough like Christian Bale to make it entirely believable. Uh, yes. So that was cool. Colin McFarlane as a uh, Jillian Loeb, who is a police commissioner. Yeah, we we find out Jillian Loeb doesn't exactly uh, fare too well in the in the second movie. No, uh, of course he is a reference to comic writer and a uh, big uh, voice in Marvel's television department, mm-hmm. Jeff Loeb. There you go. Jeff Loeb, of course, wrote uh, Long Halloween and Dark Victory. Well done. Yeah. Lo- Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. That's a combo right there for you. Yes. Rest in peace to Tim Sale, one of my all-time favorite comic book artists. Um, very influ- influential in uh, uh, encouraging me to uh, read comics. And like a lot of my enjoyment for those books that Jeff Loeb did was because of Tim Sale. Mm. Um, not just those two books, but the color books that they did together. Uh, Spider-Man Blue, uh, Daredevil Yellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a Hulk book, right? Hulk Gray? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. what a great idea. You know, like you said, one of the one of the best artists of all time, I think. is very, very good, for especially for the comic book medium. Yeah, very, very nice and humble guy. I met him years ago at oh, a comic nice. convention. Um, but yeah, rest in peace to Tim Sale. For sure. We also get Sarah Stewart as Martha Wayne. We get uh, Christine Adams as Jessica, uh, who's William Earl's secretary. Let's see. We also have Richard Brake as Joe Chill. I love that they kept the name and didn't change it. Yes. I love that we didn't get the Joker origin of I killed your father. Oh, terrible, terrible. To this day, I loathe that choice. They've done it so many times in comic book movies where the main villain has to kill the parent. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, you don't. Just So I love that they kept the Joe Chill stuff here. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I love the idea that, because the thing that makes Joe Chill so special to comic, to Batman comics is he there was no importance to him. He was just a no one. Mm-hmm. And that was just how insidious it was. It was just this guy was just a no one that was just desperate enough at that time to do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's like, you know, I, I, I'm sure I may have read this somewhere through the years and it didn't come from my own brain. Cause it's, it sounds familiar. Like I did read it somewhere, but like my, my vision of how Batman goes out is Batman gets knifed in a back alley. Like he doesn't go out because of a maniacal plan. He doesn't go out in a in a in a grandstanding move to save the city from a massive bomb, he he goes out fighting crime because it's ugly and because it because it, it's unpredictable and no matter how prepared you are, you can get caught, you know, unaware and even the even the best of us can get caught not expecting something to happen and that's when you get stabbed out of the blue. Like, I mean, if again, yeah. if this guy were real, Phil, that's maybe how he checks out. He doesn't check out by some you know, master plan where he has to save the entire city of millions of people. It's because he, you know, he jumped off the roof, banged into the, <laughs> into the ladder. Dude, that spot looked like he's like, what if that thing that doesn't move, you're going to hit the ground. You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I really love that about the Joe Chill character is that, He's just a nobody. He's just some guy in Gotham City. Mm-hmm. And it just represents um this uh this this part of the city that was bubbling up under the surface and it came up to affect him in a big way. Like this guy that ruined his life, he was a nobody. It wasn't like he was like somebody with a master plan. Mm-hmm. He was just some random guy with a gun. Yeah. Yeah. Just some random guy. We have to talk about how Batman is portrayed in this movie. When we first see him, and we know you know the scene we're talking about, and to your point, it is an hour in when he's in full costume, and the shipping containers are there, Carmine Falcone is there for some odd reason. The mastermind of the whole gang is there. Why in the world would you even be there? I don't know. Maybe it's a bad idea. But dude, it this it's a horror movie. The way he's yes. snatching guys into the darkness and you hear him, but you don't see him. I mean, I think this is maybe the best entrance 
that Batman's ever had in a movie period. I freaking love it. Yeah, I love that uh again, we we're, we're really getting into the practicality of Batman. And it's not like that he's going down and having all of these one-on-one fights with all of these guys. He's using his fear, he's using the environment to catch these guys off guard and just taking them down and picking them apart one by one. Mm. I love it. I mean, they're shooting at nothing. The guy ends up, he he like spears him through the middle of the containers. And there's a one scene where he's just pulled back into the blackness. And the guy's like, the one guy's got the 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 weapon and he's like firing and he's backing up and he goes, where are you? And it's suddenly he's there and he's like, yeah. here. Oh my God. It's, yeah, it's, I, I love it. I, because um, I don't know if you've ever played the Arkham Asylum game. Oh yeah, that. yeah. Uh, that's one of the coolest things is when you go into a room and you're getting all these stealth kills and the more and more you pick people off, those last few guys are getting more and more scared because it's like, you can tell you're eventually next. Yeah. And you see that in this scene, it's like all of these guys are getting taken off. It's like, who is this guy? So I, I love that that was a big part of the comics and that was a big part of, uh, him weaponizing fear that we got early in the movie is that he's an urban legend. Nobody's actually seen him. And if you have seen him, you don't live to tell the tale. Right. Like you just see him. Like you never see his face. You never see the human side of him. I love it. I just think it's absolutely perfect. It's just, I think you could have maybe not a whole movie, but I think you could have a situation in which you barely see the actor in the suit from head to toe until maybe five minutes left of the movie. I think you could do a whole movie like this and I think it would be just as effective because it's just feel this, this is Batman. There's a lot of things the that these guys get right with this film. Those scenes with him are absolutely what Batman is, dude. Yeah. The only thing that I, I thought was missing in this is I would like to see more of the detective aspect, mm. but all the rest of it, I, I thought this was a perfect origin for Batman. Yeah. So good. We always need a damsel in distress, so we know, of course, that Rachel Rachel Dawes is here, and it, you know, it's fine. I mean, we it, she's maybe a love interest. He grew up with her. I love the fact, Phil, that they at least connected the dots and said these two were childhood friends. She wasn't just a reporter. She wasn't someone he just met. She didn't work. She wasn't just in the DA's office, and he was sweet on her or whatever. Like they, you know, they they established a continuity of history. I think that actually helps their relationship. What relationship do you think is like the strongest in this movie? Is it her and Bruce? Is it Bruce or is it Batman and Gordon? I mean, which one do you think? Are they all equal? I mean, wh- which one do you think is most powerful here? His strongest relationship is his relationship with Alfred. Hmm. He's the one that he trusts with all of his secrets. Uh, he's the person that's known him longer than anybody else. Man, imagine if Alfred goes rogue. Holy Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that there's been a, a, a book or somewhere where they tried to make Alfred a villain and it was sure. awesome. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. People are like, what's this crap? Yeah. Yeah, because, man, he could bring the whole house of cars tumbling down. You know, at the time, I, I, I imagine, Phil, there wasn't an edict from anybody on high saying, we want you to make start establishing connections to other things because, you know, this is this is predating Iron Man. Uh, by a few years. So, you know, we don't have that happening yet. There's not a Marvel Universe to kind of, you know, rally against or whatever. But I know that at some point that, you know, the word vigilante, vigilantes was mentioned. I forget what character says it, but I'm like, in that moment, I kind of felt like, ooh, are we alluding to, are we alluding to somebody else in the DC Universe? We we only care, Phil, here in this movie about Batman in this story. But would you like to have seen, maybe we mention Metropolis, maybe we go there. I mean, do you think they need to do that here at all or just leave it the way it is? I don't think they needed to. I don't know if it fit. Mm. I think that this movie works because it stands alone. It's not connected to anything. Right, right. Uh, and this was really before the big comic book boom of 2008. Uh, and 2008 really connect, it really kicked off the phase of connected universes. Mm-hmm. Were you surprised? Speaking of the Flash, we mentioned earlier. Were you surprised that we didn't get somebody that we didn't get Christian Bale or somebody in that Flash movie at least, only just for a moment or two? 
No. Because it seems like Nolan made a point of saying that my universe was separate from anything. And mm. a big thing that he wanted to do is make a finite movie series. Right. Standalone. Yeah. Independent of everything else. Yes. Would you like to see, by the way, it, I mean, I assume none of that would happen without Nolan being attached. Would you like to see Christian Bale at some point make a return? Do you think we're too far past it? He's moved on. Do you think there's a world in which maybe we see that at some point moving forward? Well, he's done another comic book movie. <laughs> mm, yeah. He's done a very unpopular comic book movie, uh, but he's done one. Sure. He's done one outside of this one. Uh, I don't know if it works. I think that you should just move on at this point. I don't know that we need to see him as Batman ever again. Mm. He's great in that Thor movie, by the way. He's freaking great. Because I think the appeal and the nostalgia behind seeing Michael Keaton as Batman again is different. Uh, mm. Because uh, Nolan made the point of telling a, 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 giving us a trilogy that had a beginning, middle, and end. And so his story felt very much finite. It felt like it had its bow on it. Um, Michael Keaton never really got his third movie. He really, he never really got his, his uh, final bow, mm. so to speak. So I, I felt like it was different seeing him in the Flash movie. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, you know, with all this talk of multiverses and, and you know, DC's done their bit of time traveling. Marvel has a multiverse they're exploring pretty heavily. I mean, I just wonder if there'll ever be an opportunity. But yeah, it kind of seems like leave it alone. Don't go back to it. Let it be a standalone trilogy. Um, we'll get there and we get there. But I know well, you know I've talked about this before. I think don't you don't you hold number two higher than you hold number one of this trilogy? Yeah. Uh yeah, I think of course it's the better movie. It's it's definitely the biggest success mm. uh, from this trilogy. But I think that this movie is very good. Um, I think in a lot of ways it gets the Batman character uh, better than the second movie because the second movie is really the Joker show. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's really the villains that shine in the second movie. Uh, this movie I feel is very much about Bruce and Batman as a character. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you said earlier, I do love that they get it right with Batman or with, excuse me, with Bruce being like the playboy and he's got the girls in the, in the fountain, <laughs> the restaurant. It's so good. Cause like, if you just saw this guy in public, be like, man, this guy's kind of a douchebag, dude. Like, this guy sucks. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and they do a very good job of making Bruce Wayne unlikable in mm. this trilogy. Yeah. Well, the, they get you to believe that he's unlikable to the outside world. Right. I mean, it's perfect. Because he has to be. He doesn't have a choice. You cannot look at this guy. You can't take a second look at this guy. Like, yep. you got to look at this guy like this selfish guy. He's never. He would never do anything other than save his own hide. I love that I love that Alfred's the one to tell him that too. Yes. Because he tells him very early on, you know, you you you're very very wealthy and you got a lot of time on your hands and the you know, basically saying that you'll be the first one to look at. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's such a good movie, kids. And and you know, I I don't know when the last time is you folks have seen it, but this movie absolutely holds up. There's nothing about this movie that I the, the smell is funny. I think everything in it holds up. You can rip anything apart that you want to anytime you want to. But for me, this movie absolutely holds up. There are two and three, of course. And, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But I, I just, you know, ugh. part two, I'm looking forward to part three, not so much. <laughs> but uh, if this movie had stopped at part one, if it had been Batman Begins and that would have been it. I absolutely would have been okay with that. I would have been okay if we had not revisited this. We always would have said, what if? But I would never have looked at this movie as, as being incomplete because it doesn't feel incomplete to me at all. It just feels like this is the introduction. You guys do, go do a new new dude if you want to, but this is our story of how this how this guy begins. It's fantastic, man. Yeah, it, it's really a great origin story. It tells a very complete story. Uh, gives us uh, a great teaser at the end with the Joker card. Mm. 
Uh, I remember sitting in the theater like, no way. Because, again, I think it was very smart to start this franchise without the Joker. Uh, because, you know, for most people, Batman needs Joker in some ways. Joker is his most famous villain. Yeah. And so I think in really in order to build this movie around Bruce and make the story about Bruce, um, and we immediately said in the second movie that Joker is such a big part of that movie um, that I thought it was a good idea to not focus on that character first. Mm, I totally agree. And, yeah. And the teaser is just so great. Uh, man, it's just so funny thinking about when this came out. Like I said, when I, when I went to see it in 2005 and where I was in my life, like early 20s, um, and this was like right before the real huge boom of comic book movies. This was a little bit after like the first boom period with X-Men movies, Spider-Man movies, and all this other stuff. And this was really, it really hit, comic book movies hit a different stride because I feel like this helped some movies be taken more serious. It helped to legitimize the genre in some ways. Mm. Um, So by the time 2008 hits and we get Iron Man, we get Incredible Hulk and uh, Dark Knight, that's really that's really a formative year for the genre. Oh, I mean, you're right. It's yeah. Without this movie, you, you kind of question what the landscape is moving forward for either, either company really. I mean, it's yes. Grounding it. And dude, we we've, we've done the iron first iron man. Like that movie's for as fantastic as it is with armor and stuff. It's pretty grounded. Like it feels like real yes. people, you know? Yes. By the way, we haven't mentioned one time the car cause chicks dig the car. What do you think about the Batmobile, the Tumblr in this movie, man? Uh, the Tumblr is a lot of fun. It is not probably my favorite uh, Batmobile. Uh, it's it's just tough to to top the eighty nine Batmobile. Mm. Uh, but I really like the Tumblr. I like the scenes with the Tumblr. The car chase in this movie with the Tumblr is great. Mm. Um, there is a mo- There was a game that came out at, at the same time as this movie, and you can drive the Tumblr. Also, very fun. Awesome. Yeah. I love how when that scene happens that the cops are trying to call it in and they, it's the car they rolled over and it's like, it's black, uh, a, a tank. Like he doesn't know what to call it. <laughs> yes. I love that Gordon ended up in the nose of the thing. I love that too. That was awesome. <laughs> so good. He ends up in the car. It's awesome. Again, dude, real world. It, it's the real thing. Like it, you know, this feels like an ex military vehicle. This feels like something that was designed but was never commissioned. The military said no for whatever reason. God, man, because this is what would this is what would be the case if again there was an individual who decided to use his money for good instead of evil. About a lot of chance of that happening in this country these days. But like, if it did happen, <laughs> like you kind of feel like, yeah, that would make sense. This is how you would start. You would you would start with ex-military items. That's how you would get yourself off the ground as Batman. Yeah. Of course, uh, in this day and age, that makes the most sense. But yeah, I've always likened the Tumblr to like a tank, but it also was like the Lamborghini of t- of tanks because it's loaded ground. It has like that same kind of form. Yeah. You know, it's bulky, but it's got a little bit of smoothness to it. It's not so sharp edge that it doesn't have some kind of form. Yeah. I love the design for it. Yeah, same. The suit is, I mean, again, the suit is good. I think it looks sharp. The headpiece, I'm glad they fixed for part two, because that's the thing with Keaton's Batman suit that, you know. He has has to turn all the way around. He can't turn his neck. Turn all the way around. Talk about getting a drop on somebody. It shouldn't be too hard to get drop on Batman, because as long as he don't hear you coming, you're good, because he can't turn around. So I I love, like, the tech that he uses in the movie. I love the rain. I love the stuff that makes it feel more elemental, uh, where it makes it feel like it's, again, it's a real world. What do you think about him giving that kid that piece of tech? Because, buddy, for years after that happened, in my head, I was trying to connect the dots that I wonder who this kid becomes in the DC universe. He's got a piece of tech from Bruce Wayne Batman, dude. Yeah, I I just love that uh, a big part of this Batman movie is, yes, he's weaponizing fear, but also he's trying to make early relationships on to reach people because that's really the only way he's going to save Gotham. Yeah. If it's just one man waging war against crime, that's not enough. You have to reach people. Yeah. Like that kid is not going to be scared of Batman now. Yes. You're going to inspire that in that kid that you can, 
you don't have to, you know, be swallowed up by the kind of abyss of this city that feels like never ending darkness. Like mm-hmm. even this guy that is surrounded by darkness is a beacon in the city. Mm-hmm. It's like a new frontier when they asked him about him changing his suit. And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm my, the goal is to scare criminals, not little kids. I think was the line. It's really good. Yep. Well, kids, uh, there is Batman begins. Lots to talk about. I need a nap. That's a lot, but man, so worth it. Great freaking movie. The bats fill. We can't really wind this up without talking about the scene where he called the bats in. And Gordon's like, what's that? And he says, back up. Again, straight out of Batman Year One. Freaking fantastic. Loved it. Yeah, loved the visual of him uh, standing in the cave as Bruce the first time and conquering his fear, standing in front of, standing in the cave with all of those bats and circulating him. Such a cool visual. But also that scene of Batman jumping down that flight of stairs with all of the bats as well. Uh, So cool looking. I love that they incorporated them. Because you could have left it out and it would have been fine. But they incorporated them hardcore. It wasn't just that he fell down the shaft. It wasn't just the one flew in the house. It wasn't just anything. It was, it. they just, it, they're a big part of the movie, man. Yeah, I, and I love that they set up early on that the reason he chose Bats is because they were his greatest fear. He, yeah. They were his fear. And he turned his greatest fear into uh, the scourge of Gotham City. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like you're right. It was just something he feared. Like he found a way to take something that he feared and turn it into into like villains, like biggest fear. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Why bet, sir? Yeah. They scare me. And what was it? He's like, it's time to to make them know, show them my dread or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of the dialogue is a little bulky here and there, but it's fine. Like you said, it's a comic movie. Yeah. But they give us so many, uh, uh, payoff moments with the dialogue that it's fine. Like I said, the, the, even the stuff from the beginning with uh, him and, and his father, and he's telling him, why, why do we fall, Bruce? Mm-hmm. We learn to pick ourselves up. And, and when, so, so with that, when Alfred says it later, it feels like an even bigger moment. Yeah. Yeah. Tying everything back together for sure. Well, kids, you did, again, this is a matter of the right cast, the right director, the right story, the right time. Everything came together. Can't say that for a lot of DC things that happened after this. Let's be honest. But to be fair, you can't say that about a lot of other studios trying things either. It is what it is. Sometimes you don't always get the perfect storm. But you absolutely got it here because this movie is a definite classic. And it did more for Batman than I think anybody would have anticipated. And we're still talking about it after the fact. 20 years next year makes me crazy. I'm... uh, the way time passes nuts but that's your movie kids and again we're probably going to tackle part two and then maybe just maybe you'll hear us talk tackle part three as well but phil let's uh put a put a bow on this and get your last word on batman begins great movie came out at the perfect time uh kicked off the definitive batman trilogy uh if you're like me and have the box set on blu-ray um yeah just perfect perfect uh origin movie uh great casting great writing uh great story and i think that that was really the best thing about this movie is it isn't really carried by big action scenes or uh any of that other stuff it's really the storytelling and the character building that makes this movie work yeah yeah i can't say any better than that i mean it's it's absolutely um, everything working together, like we said, everything works together to make this movie great. I mean, um, and we'll see it pay off kids as well. The cast, the director, the story, we'll see it pay off in part two as well. Um, uh, with critical acclaim, of course, and of course a major, major tragedy, which we'll get to when we do part two. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, be sure you check out Batman Begins. Hopefully we've made you want to watch it again if you haven't watched it already in anticipation of listening to this review. But stay tuned, kids. Part two's on the way. And in the meantime, at least for now, that is Batman Begins. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. 
Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6M Podcast. We'll see you next time.